Hi, this is Sheena. I just want to point out, unfortunately, we had a little bit of sound difficulties with this one, but bear in mind, we were recording Canada, South Africa, and Australia all at the same time. So there was bound to be a little bit of oopsie. Unfortunately, it happened with Lee Winter's audio, but please bear with us. We did everything we could to fix it. Hi there. I'm Sheena, and this is the Lesbian Review Podcast. This podcast is a spin-off of the popular review site, thelesbianreview.com, where we review the best books, movies, and music with leading lesbian, bi, or queer women. The goal of this podcast is to bring you closer to the best queer media and give you access to interviews with people who are behind the scenes in creating it. Today I'm joined by Tara Scott and Lee Winter and we're doing something we've never done before. We're talking about a book and I'm talking with my fellow reviewer and we're discussing it with the author. So that's pretty cool. Lee, thank you for joining me today. Hey, you're welcome. And Tara, thank you so much for joining me today. Glad to be here. Okay, cool. So we're talking about breaking character. Now, Tara did an awesome review for it, for TLR, but I read it afterwards and I've kind of fallen in love with this book. There's just so much to it. There's so many layers. There's so many interesting things. And so I wanted to get them both on here so that we can dissect and just really get into the nitty gritties of it. I'm going to give you a warning here. If you haven't read this book, there will be spoilers. So stop the podcast, read the book, then come back because you're going to want to hear some of the cool stuff we're talking about today. Lee, let's start with you. Can you give us a synopsis of this book? Like what's it about for those that haven't read it so that they can be enticed and then go off and read it? Okay, well, here's the blurb I actually wrote. (laughs) Life has become a farcical mess for icy British A-lister Elizabeth Thornton. America's most hated villain stars in a top-rated TV medical drama that she hates. Now she's been romantically linked to her perky new co-star Summer due to the young woman's clumsiness. As a closeted actress, that's the last thing Elizabeth needs. If she could just get her dream movie role, life would be so much better. The only problem is that the eccentric French filmmaker offering it insists on meeting her girlfriend, Summer, first. Summer Hayes is devastated when her co-star shuns her for accidentally sparking rumours they're lovers. Now the so-called British bitch has the audacity to ask Summer to pretend to be her girlfriend to get her a role. Elizabeth doesn't even like Summer. Oh, how she'd love to tell her no. And Summer definitely would if it wasn't for the fact she's maybe a tiny little bit in love with the impossible woman. A lesbian celebrity romance about gaining love, losing masks, and trying to stick to the script. That's pretty accurate. Well done on an accurate uh, synopsis. If the author can't write an accurate synopsis, there's something wrong with the author, I think. (laughs) Well, that's a debate for another day. Okay, so let's start with the characters. So the main girl next door character's name is Summer. And three words I would use to describe her is clumsy, brilliant, and kind. (laughs) <laughs> is she perhaps the nicest girl next door ever in Lesfic? This is the question I'm posing to you guys. What do you think, Tara? I don't know. The thing that I like about her is that she is incredibly kind, but she also has a massive backbone. And she gets underestimated because of her looks, but she's a lot smarter than anyone gives her credit for. So while she is she's very nice. She's incredibly thoughtful. She, you know, remembers her girlfriend's former assistant's son's birthday to get them a present for like, that's just how she is. But at the same time, she doesn't take shit from people. And she knows how to take those perceptions and work with them to her advantage to get to the the ends that she wants. And so like, yes, she's a girl next door, but I don't actually see her as a typical girl next door. Okay. Lee, what do you think? I agree with Tara. Um, I also would add Plucky to the list. She's sort of got this fierceness to her where and she sees an injustice and she sees it several times and she has to fight even though her sister and everyone's going, no, 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 that's just, you know, not, mm. but she can't resist righting a wrong and Maybe that makes her too nice or too sweet, but I actually just think that's just part of her character, part of her draw is that she just she just likes to stand up for the underdogs and stand up for, you know, the the right thing. And that I actually lay a lot of that down at Sky's feet, her mother, who is just a really good human being and has raised her well. See, I agree with both of you, but I think that that does make her the nicest girl next door because she does have the backbone and yet She's never arrogant. She's never aggressive or frustrated or it doesn't come across ever. 
So yes, she is underestimated, but the way she handles it makes her a really mature, amazing kind of character. She is the epitome of what I'd like to be ultimately in my life, if that makes sense. That's really cool. Yeah, she definitely has poise because like, you can even tell when she's experiencing something really unpleasant. She keeps her shit together every time. Right. Yeah. Which like is not the easiest thing to do right like she's just a really good grown-up like sure she can play those young adult roles but one of my favorite moments is when she tells Bess, like you can't toy with me like i'm a person with real feelings like she's actually a better adult in that moment than Bess has ever been with grace because grace messes with Bess at every turn and summer knows herself well enough she's so self-aware and I think that is down to Sky. Like she's been, she's clearly been raised so well that she is able to have that entirely mature conversation where she puts her own self interest first. Like she knows that she has to take care of herself because nobody else is going to do it at that moment. I think part of it might also be being a child actor. You do have to grow up really fast, and there are a lot of crossroads, and you can either turn into that bratty, spoiled person, or you can have a really good parent who sits you down and says look a lot of people are going to try and use you take advantage uh, want you for your looks want you for all these things and I think from day one Sky and and Sky's partner Brock have been you know right on top of that and she's she's used it really well but that's where she gets her maturity from I believe because she started so young and had to be watchful and aware so young. I love that you introduced the family dynamics. So there's small snippets throughout the story where Summer talks about her parents. So one of the things is Brock teaches her to fall correctly because she's so clumsy that she can't do the karate and things he's trying to teach her, but at least he can teach her to fall. And that's such a beautiful father-daughter sort of thing. Yeah. It adds a layer and a, a dynamic that's, that um, makes the character exactly what you just said. Yeah. Okay, so let's talk about Elizabeth. Is she an ice queen? Nope. Nope. <laughs> she is not. She's an introvert. She's British. Yeah. But she... She's not... Um, she's not guarded as much as she's private, and those are entirely different things. Like, if you look at, say, The Brutal Truth... Elena is definitely an ice queen. She's that like super prickly on purpose to keep people at bay. Mm -hmm. Elizabeth isn't prickly. She's just not outgoing. She's kind of shy and she doesn't have that same like ability to go out and make friends with everybody that Summer has. She's never tried to cultivate it. Maybe she could if she tried harder. Um, but she's not like purposefully being an asshole to keep people away from her. Which is why I think... She's not an ice queen. Okay, except that I think she is an ice queen, and I'll tell you why. <laughs> for me, the definition That's fine. for me the definition of an ice queen is someone who standoffish or cold at first, and then thaws because of the intervention of a love interest. Now, whether Elizabeth means to be or not, whether she's thrust into that role by the circumstances of her shooting and that kind of thing, she is. She's very guarded, and she's. Um, expects the worst from people and she doesn't let herself look how long it takes her to tell Summer that she's a lesbian even after Summer came out to her mm. now that's very guarded mm. I still don't think she's a nice queen I don't care I disagree with you <laughs> <laughs> both right um but i actually wrote it thinking oh she's very british and reserved and everything like tara said but i also was aware that very british very guarded very reserved would come across as icy to an american audience so by that definition yes yeah, she's very much a nice queen so it just depends on your i don't know <laughs> I've dealt with a lot of British who I wouldn't really see as ice queens, but I know for a fact that Americans have met them and gone, oh, she was so cold. Oh, my goodness. And that's just, you know, I think it's more regional. I might also have my view colored by the fact that I see Lee Winter ice queens as Elena Bartel and Catherine Ayers, and that's like like you have your ice queen type, and then I don't, just don't think she fits in that. 
Maybe there's a Kinsey spectrum of ice queens. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Excellent. Okay, so can we call it the winter? Can we call it the winter scale? I uh, like that. Oh, that's perfect. <laughs> 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 the winter scale. Okay, so well, she's definitely on the winter scale somewhere, but we can't yes, yes, ne- necessarily yes. decide. So, hit us up and tell us what do you think? Is she an ice queen or not? Is Tara right? Am I right? Or is Lee Winter being very sweet to both of us? Okay, I'm gonna say she's like a two. If like six is ultimate ice queen, she's like a two on the scale. Why would six? Why six? Why are we measuring to six? Because the Kinsey scale is between one and six. Oh, so we're just adapting the Kinsey scale to the winter scale. Okay, got it. All right. Listen, it's the end of my day where I'm at. <laughs> where do you put um, on the six being extra icy, like Mount Everest, and one being slightly cool toes? Where, do you, where, where um, Sheena, do you put uh, Elizabeth? Uh, four. Wow, four. Yeah, so I'd put her in the middle because she's not your iciest ice queen for sure. And that's probably why I like her. But she's she's definitely got some frost happening there. It, it, uh, Summer does not walk away unscathed, hey? That's true. A little bit of frost. A little bit of frostbite. Mm. All right. Now let's talk about one of my favorite characters, Grace. I loved Grace because I thought she added such an interesting dynamic to the book. And Tara, Tara has strong feelings on the matter. Tell us. Tell us, Tara. She's one of my least favorite characters of all time. I hate her so much. <laughs> Love it. She is a terrible. She is a terrible person. She is. I was gonna say selfishness. No, well, no. She's like she's a textbook narcissist. Like she is actual. Like if you just look it up in the whatever they call it, the DSM, whatever. Like that is her. She is horrible to Elizabeth. She is horrible to the rest of the team. Um, I was not sad to see her go, and I would have been fine to find out that she died in obscurity. <laughs> You're welcome. Wow, that's... <laughs> yep. We have feelings. So here's the th- I don't like people being mean to other people. And she was really mean to someone that I loved a whole lot. So, therefore, I hate her. She was such a fabulous character to have in the book, though, because... Mm. Elizabeth's feelings for her mimicked Summer's feelings for Elizabeth, but because the dynamics were so different, because the characters themselves were so different, it was such a fascinating thing to watch play out. What could have been, yeah, which, I mean, you know, did actually happen. Yeah, the difference between someone who has empathy and someone who does not have a capacity for empathy. Not just that, but okay, so from. So the way Summer handled Elizabeth was a heck of a lot more mature than the way. Elizabeth handled Grace. Oh, sorry. I meant the other way around because... I know. So that's why I'm saying. Yeah, yeah. Uh, from the, the the receiver's perspective, Elizabeth was much nicer to Summer than Grace was to Elizabeth. But I just thought the whole dynamic was so interesting because it was like two parallel stories. And, you know, I'm sure when you did this because you were thinking... I want the reader to really see and and root for Elizabeth to to drop Grace and and say, Summer, you are actually the love of my life. <laughs> well, I I saw Grace as textbook narcissist, exactly as Tara says. I also wanted her to be an embodiment of all the bad bad things Hollywood does to a human being as well. I like. They put so much crap on women at a certain age and I'm not saying that a person would automatically turn out like Grace if they went through all the things that um, Grace did, where she's got her own sociopathy or whatever that is. But she is what happens when you put someone with a bad personality in a terrible environment for them and then hit blend. And she spent her entire life trying to feel back to the worship how worshipped she was in England, and it's just not coming. She just keeps persisting, thinking, well, surely they'll see my glory any day now. And the longer it goes, the worse she gets and the more horrible she suddenly starts to become with Elizabeth when she feels her slipping away. And I promise you, even though it's not in the book, she wasn't like this at the start. 
when she was strong and powerful and felt like she had it all together, she was actually really nice and doting and probably a pretty good mentor, but it all went horribly wrong as her sense of self started slipping and she was trying to hold on to things too tightly and it just got worse and worse and her narcissism grew and she became what she was at the end, a very sad individual. And I actually thought that Elizabeth was generous when she said, I can um, feel sorry for someone who have gone to have gone that far to go that deep uh, and still not want to have time with them. So she was more forgiving, I think, than someone else in her position might be. How long was Grace supposed to have been in the States? I couldn't quite suss that out. Well, Grace would have been uh, there for the same amount of time as Elizabeth, or just slightly longer, so about seven years. Okay. Yeah. I mean, seven years of, like, little to no work can definitely screw with your head. Yeah. Especially if your whole identity has been built around not only the work but being worshipped. So her whole identity until that point, until she got to Hollywood, was I am a golden goddess. And then immediately she's nothing. You are nothing. And you're too old, you're too this, you're too British, you're too tall, you're too whatever. And it just wore her down to the point where she was a horrible human being. I did like how Summer figured her out immediately. Like it took... You I, I just liked... Like it. You, you no, I did like it. You did like it, right, yeah. Yeah, I liked that Summer was so savvy that it took like what, four minutes for her to figure out exactly who Grace was and exactly what she was doing. Some people read a room really well, though. I mean, Alex was also well aware of what was going on. But also, again, um, Summer grew up as a child star and she got very, very good at looking for the motive. Why is that person being nice? Why is that person doing that? And I, I do think that really helped her be aware of the ripples in the room more than, say, the guys were who didn't seem that uh, switched on to it. So Grace never made Elizabeth feel awful about uh, the attraction. She just kind of used it as a a worship, if you like, which I appreciated. She just, what can I get out of this? She thought to herself, well, I can just be worshipped. <laughs> she thought it was a good thing. But there's a very famous actor, I won't name names, but there's a very famous actress who... Um, I don't know how to phrase it, but she famously loved her lesbian fans. She didn't have a lesbian bone in her body, but she loved their worship. And that was a very big thing for her. She just loved being worshipped. Then she didn't give a, you know, she wouldn't ever play gay because she didn't even see herself in that way in any way, shape or form. But my God, her lesbian fans, they were just, mm -mm. some people like that. That's Grace embodied every bad, shitty trait that some Hollywood actresses and actors pick up. And I had a little bit of fun just amplifying that. That poor woman's got them all. I liked her character from the point of view. I thought it gave depth to the story and I liked the parallels between her and Elizabeth and Elizabeth and Summer. I just thought it was interesting. Okay, let's talk about the mysterious Rachel Cho. So Rachel Cho is her... Yeah, Rachel was the agent in Delvine... Delvine was, was the manager. manager. Yeah. Right. Okay, so there's this mysterious Rachel Cho who's this lesbian who doesn't want her, her stars to be lesbian. And she is quite a strong character in the book, except you never actually meet her. You sort of hear about her or she's on the phone. Yeah. That's such an interesting thing. Why did you choose to do that as opposed to ever having a meeting with Rachel or actually us meeting her? Well, it was a really simple reason is because... I just didn't want to have Delvin and Rachel, like they're just two similar kind of sounding roles to people who aren't in Hollywood. I just didn't want to have two people being confusing. So I kept one at a distance, which was Rachel, who was the more hard ass of them all, and, and brought Delvin forward because she was more of a friend anyway. So she could do the, look, I love you best, but you've got to, you know, listen to me now, sort of chats. Because Rachel was like, what the hell? Fix it. And Delphine was, look, darling, honey, sweetie, let's sit down and talk about this. So, yeah, I just didn't want two similar characters. But in all the research I did, I found that a woman of Bess's stature would definitely have at least two people, like at least the agent and the manager. She wouldn't just have one. So I had to have both to be accurate. So Okay. All right, now let's swing across to the dedication. I'm going to read your dedication because I loved it. I thought it was awesome. 
to all the actresses who put themselves out there over and over for their craft. I had no idea how exposing and confronting the job was until I dug beneath the superficial crust and began to research what acting really is. To be so vulnerable and open oneself up to the constant scrutiny, demands and critique is staggering. To be expected often to bear one's bodies as well as one's emotions and souls and somehow remain unaffected is staggering. That takes such courage. So let's talk about this. Let's talk about some of the research you did uh, that gave you this dedication. Well, I spent a lot of time Googling um, how do you go about doing a sex scene for actors and actresses, but mainly the actresses ones. The, the guys didn't seem to affect it by it, but the, the women, the range of how they dealt with it and how they experienced it was quite different, and a lot of them felt very vulnerable. And by the time I'd read about two dozen stories of how they prepped and how they felt and how they went through it all and how sometimes some bad things happen, I was feeling so empathic towards them. I was like, oh, you poor thing. <laughs> I just, I think it leaked out quite a lot, actually, in the story, especially in that sex scene, because I just felt so, so bad that this is what we expect women especially to do, um, just to earn their crust. Like, you know, it just, it felt, it felt a lot. It really did. It felt a lot. And some women told stories about, um, I remember one story, it still sticks with me, this actress was saying how they had an extra and he was supposed to be um well extra is not the right word but he was a bit player he was supposed to have sort of rough anonymous sex with this actress as part of the, the movie and he just was getting his rocks off on it he was treating it like and she said i came away feeling like i'd been assaulted and when i complained to the director and my agent they both just said oh you know he's just oh, he's just taking advantage just move on just forget it and she said i just didn't know what to do with this you know I felt, I really, I felt so bad for some of these women. I really do. It's really confronting what they have to go go through. Wow. Uh, yeah, you don't actually think about it, hey? It's part of the story. And sex is such an expected part of media these days. I had an interesting um, chat with a friend of mine who said, I felt so bad after reading your book about how I view sex in movies that I thought, should I feel guilty for enjoying a sex scene in a movie now? And I said, they can still have sex in movies, but you just got to question why it's necessary to show every little thing. Why do you have to go to the full, full extreme, you know, every single, you know, I mean, we've got imaginations. I'm not talking fade to black. I mean, just, you know, do we, can we tone it down slightly and give these poor actresses a break? She was fine with that. So, <laughs> I mean, that does make sense. And, Okay, so one of the other things you mentioned, speaking of your research, is the, an autograph hunter. So they are approached in the cafe with by a woman with a, a photograph of Summer, and she wants an autograph. And Summer has a really interesting reaction to it. And the whole thing was that this woman is going to sell the autograph for money. Like, you know, this is how she makes money. Uh, do these people actually exist? How did you find out about these people? Yeah, um, I, I read about an actress who was constantly being played by this one quote-unquote fan who just, it was funny how she always happened to have a black and white photo of her or her co-stars if she was out with them every time she turned around and, and she caught a sight of the, the trunk of the car and there was a whole bunch of these photos just like every type of person from her show. So this woman would sell them but... Um, I have seen fan conventions where people would get uh, signed photos of the stars and then an hour later it would be up on eBay, that kind of thing. So, yeah, there's people who aren't in it at all for the star experience. They're just, you know, trying to make a quid. It wouldn't even occur to me that these people existed, but it does, like, it makes sense. When I read it, I was like, yeah, I can totally believe this. So how much research did you do generally about filming and being on set and so on? Because you don't really have a background in that, right? No, I mean, when I was at uni, I did study one unit of video production, but it's not really my thing. I mean, I remember having sort of vague memories of editing and production, putting that together. But um, no, basically, I researched every single thing I could. I went a day in the life of a director, a day in the life of a producer, um, I watched videos, all that kind of stuff. So, yeah, that was pretty much it. And I also had access to a very kind actress who was helping me out on the acting side um, who'd tell me if I went a little bit too off the rails on some of my details. She'd say, no, that's not what happens. <laughs> so, 
anyway. Because it read very accurately. Yeah. I'm, I'm pleased to have heard that, but I've heard that from a few people, and I'm just glad that Google was my friend and did not lead me astray. You're listening to The Lesbian Talk Show. TheLesbianTalkShow.com, your hub of podcast information. Okay, so a big turning point in this book for both characters was the shooting of the sex scene, right? So I want to spend some time on that. They go off to the middle of nowhere, and there's a sex scene that they have to shoot where Summer, who's the sweetest girl next door, is playing Lust, um, and Elizabeth is the main character of this film. It's so interesting for me that during the sex scene, Summer was really struggling because she didn't want to take advantage. So it was like a complete reversal of what you were talking about just now, where the actresses felt completely vulnerable. Right? Yeah. Tara, did this scene stick out for you specifically? Because for me, this was a big moment in the book. I mean, it takes up a, quite a chunk of the book, too. I'm trying to remember the first time I read it. Um, but it was basically just like two days of any time I wasn't at work or asleep, I was reading this book. So it kind of all is a blur at this point. Um, but it, I see what you mean. Like, it's a massive turning point in the nature of their relationship because they're they're like friendly colleagues before that. They're like they're. I wouldn't even say they were quite friends before that point. Summer knew how she felt because she'd felt that way for you know more than a decade. But it was really kind of that point when Summer gets really vulnerable and confesses why she's having such a hard time with the scene and there's that attraction and she doesn't want to make um, Bess uncomfortable. I really liked seeing how that. It, it was like a flip was switched in Bess's head. It was like she was able to start examining, you know, why is she more comfortable around Summer than she is with anyone else? Why is she able to open up to her? Why is she able to get, like, yeah, it takes her a while after that to say that she's a lesbian, but she's still much more open and vulnerable with her than she is with anyone else in her life. And that that scene was really kind of pitiful for that. And it also, like... Was it Alex? I think it was Alex who said, like, she's going to blow your world open. And that's kind of the moment when it happens. Like, it's that super sexy explosion where it's like, oh, shit. Everything I thought was true is not. And, like, the world is upside down and cats are dogs and I don't know anything anymore. Because even when Grace comes, like, she still kind of sort of feels that tug. But also that, like, who do you think you are talking the way you talk about one of the nicest people I've ever met in my life? Like it, it's also all tied into her figuring out exactly who Grace is. And it's like, it's, it's not just a, it's not just a turning point for their relationship. It's a turning point for Elizabeth, I think. Mm. It's a fact to Elizabeth that Summer is nice. So if someone's telling you um, a completely opposite thing, you suddenly start to question everything. Wait, this person who I looked up to and I thought her word was gospel. Well, well does that mean everything she said is now suspect? And it really was an interesting turning point, yeah. Uh, when they're first doing the sex scene, it's the most awkward, horrible, cringe-worthy <laughs> thing in the book. Mm -hmm. I just, I wanted to close my eyes because I felt so <laughs> humiliated for the characters. Yeah. Like, I didn't want to, don't, don't make me read, read this because shame. So, you know, I don't want to watch them go through this, right? <laughs> I... I did love how the director was like, something is wrong. I don't know what's wrong. You guys are messed up. You know what's wrong. Go fix it. Just go away. I don't care what you do. Yeah. Fix it. Come back when it's fixed. Don't come back until it's fixed. You have 10 minutes. And it was so... Also, can we just... Can we talk about that guy for a second? I know we're talking about the sex scene, but he is wonderful, is all I want to say. I love that weird French man. Okay, but wait, wait, don't go away from the sex scene because... <laughs> In that moment where he says something's wrong, go fix it. He also talks about that. I think he says that that movie with the blue title or something, and then the story of the straight oh, actresses. Yeah. Is that true? Well, it's blue is the warmest color, right? Yeah, it was a big scandal at the time for those who haven't read the book. I don't know why you're listening to this podcast if you haven't read the book, but blue is the warmest color. The two actresses who had a very long, very graphic sex scene in this French movie. After the movie was shot and after it won the Palme d'Or, 
said we felt exposed and vulnerable and taken advantage of and used and it was absolutely horrible. It's the worst experience of my life. And the French director was stunned and appalled and shocked and he had no idea and he said, you have forever sullied my words, my, my film. And, um, yeah, it was a bit of a, <laughs> of a shit show around after that. So I could see Jean-Claude Badour saying, well, I've learned from that and I'm never going to, I'm only ever going to cast lovers so no one can ever say that about my films and, you know, which gave context also to why he specifically wanted them as a couple. And mm. I really appreciated that because before that I was just like, this dude is so weird. But, <laughs> but, he's still weird. Yeah, he's, he's just but lovely he's, and weird. To his madness, you know. He, he had, yeah. he's a, you know, I can see why he and Sky vibrate on the same frequency. They're both eccentric. Yes. I love that line. I love that line so much. <laughs> Okay, so then then they go off after the the awkwardness that is horrible, horrible, <laughs> cringe worthy, terrible, and then they sit in the trailer, and then there's a moment where Elizabeth says to Summer, "What's going on? You have to tell me, right?" And at that point, Summer has no choice; <laughs> they have half an hour to fix the all the problems between them, which seems like an impossibility. Or else they're both going to get fired. And so the only choice she really has at that point is to confess her feelings for Elizabeth. But what was an interesting thing for me about this scene is Elizabeth does not come out of the closet at this point. Summer does. So, I mean, it's a natural thing for somebody to say, oh, I'm gay. And then the other person say, oh, I'm gay too. Like, la la, let's wave some, you know, happy flags. Why did Elizabeth at this point not choose to come out to Summer and leave her thinking that this was all a one-sided thing? I'm going to guess it's the same reason why she didn't tell Rachel to go pound salt when Rachel told her to stay away from Summer on set. What reason is that? Well, it's that, like, it's so, in like, it's just so ingrained at this point mm. to just keep that part hidden. It's like, yep, okay, nope, that's the script. We're sticking to it. We never deviate. This is just something we're never going to do. Because it takes her a while to come out to Summer, for sure. But, like, even when, in the follow-up short story, even when she decides to come out publicly, she's not comfortable with it. And she acknowledges she would never, ever, ever be comfortable with it. That's just who she is at her core. Like, it's a commitment that she's kind of made for, what, like 20 years? She, that's a very big thing. That's it's 90% who she is and 10% of it is I've only known Summer a month and Summer could blow on off to the, you know, and she's just told someone her biggest, darkest secret and then off she goes into the, you know, and, well, do I just keep adding myself to every gay actress who says I'm gay or has she got to have proof in her soul somehow that this one's the one before I actually, or this one's going to be different and special and important and not just going to, be two ships in the night. I mean, actors and actresses, they form these really close bonds and then suddenly the bonds are gone and the show's over and then these people that they were so close to, they've moved on. So for someone like Elizabeth, she had to trust that this was a person who would be in her life for a while. She had to trust that Summer was discreet and she had to also overcome her own mental blocks, which are huge. And she hadn't even told Brian and Rowan, both of whom are also gay, and like some of her oldest friends. Yeah, so it's not like she was singling Summer out either. She really had a lot of, like, like I say, 90% was who she is and 10% was, well, I don't know if Summer's going to be around in the next year. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so that moment and that choice uh, and the vulnerability that Summer, because the thing is, sure, Brian and whatever were friends with her and that's all great, but there was no vulnerability no. there. Right? There was huge vulnerability from Summer's point when they were shooting the scene. She really just like completely opened herself up to being destroyed. So this, that choice right there is why I say she's a nice guy. I, I see that. I see that. Look, it was a hard choice and I can imagine a lot of people wouldn't make the same choice as well. But Bess has got a lot of introvert, uh, introversion. Is that the word? She is really, yeah, she's had walls for her whole life. She wasn't yet ready to have that conversation. And she did say at the time, or think at the time, this secret has the power to hurt. And she had been through so much crap over the British bitch stuff that I just don't think she wanted to have every single part of her life be part if Summer turned out to be indiscreet. 
Well, and I mean, programming that we have kind of, because we all have our own internal programming based on whether it's like how we've been raised, other experiences in our lives, um, that can be a real bitch to overcome. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. It's huge. You see that from people from many religious families too. My God, they have it so hard to overcome their programming. Like that to is over- me. <laughs> oh, there you go. So if you were at the height of your programming and someone said, well, I'm gay, you wouldn't, your first thought wouldn't be, well, I'm bi. No, you'd be like, that's nice. Lovely. <laughs> yeah. Yes, excellent. Good for you for being Actually, so brave and strong. You- you probably more uh in, well at least this was my experience before I was ready to come out I was very and I wasn't even from a religious space but I was very like oh you're gay I'm going to run in the opposite direction in case you know I'm gay too mm-hmm. yeah that's another reaction that you see that's another reaction you see I want to also talk for one yeah. second about the vulnerability of Summer and she tells the story about when she was very young her first kiss was on screen I actually mm. talked about I think it was uh, Macaulay Culkin in that B movie. I can never remember the name of it. Um, he got oh, my, my girl, wasn't it? My girl, yeah. And years later, he said that that was his first on-screen kiss. And I thought that is the saddest freaking thing I have ever heard. That poor boy didn't even get that for himself. And then I started to really think about what it must be like for child stars. And all of them had their first kisses stolen, pretty much, because Hollywood has this weird thing about romanticizing children. And I remember thinking, well, that would have been a really impactful moment for summer, wouldn't it? as a child, having to kiss some guy, especially a guy who had a crush on her. So, yeah, I can I can see why she had a lot of vulnerability involving the sex scene, and it wasn't all just because this was Elizabeth. It was also she had a very, very strong sense of justice about consent. Mm-hmm. Which makes her so, such a timely character for, for where we are now in the world. Yeah, sad, isn't it? Well, it's interesting because it also brings up the point that consent is not just a male-female thing, and if you're a woman, you still have to think about consent. Yes. Yes, you should. If you're not, why aren't you? And and it's lovely that Summer was so worried about taking advantage of Elizabeth. Yes, absolutely. Okay, so then then they go on. Now, now when Summer's cracked open, they manage to go on and have the most glorious sex scene on earth. (laughs) Twice. (laughs) And then... (laughs) Because they did a second take and then they did close-ups. (laughs) <laughs> During that scene, Summer says Beth instead of uh, the character's name. Yeah, Elspeth. And that was interesting for me. So let's talk about that. I, I have so many feelings on this. Tara? Well, she does something similar too um, in Bess's last scene on their TV show when she almost forgets that she's acting and it's a character and she blurts out for the whole world to hear that she loves her. And it was, you know, everybody could read it as the character saying it to the other character, but it was actually Summer saying it to Bess. And there's just, I don't know, I guess they just have this kind of in, intense uh, chemistry going on that kind of pulls her out of herself. Yeah, there's a lot of blurring of the lines. I think um, I think Elizabeth is Summer's weakness in that regard. I'd, I'd like to think she's professional enough. She doesn't do this on the regular. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think if there's one thing you managed to, to really – showcase and this is how professional summer actually is and how good she is at at acting to the point where people don't actually realize she's doing it yeah she's very smart so lee you mentioned fan fiction a couple of times in this book and fan fiction and social media and so on was actually a big reason why the two main characters got their own lesbian storyline on the tv show right so let's talk about fan fiction. I know you are a huge fan of fan fiction. Yep. But have you brought it up in any of your other books? Is this the first book? I think it is the first book I've mentioned it in. And it, there's nothing um, deeper than it really seemed to suit the characters. I mean, you get those two people sparking off each other in a TV show, which I had in mind was sort of like a Grey's Anatomy style TV show, then absolutely the fan fiction would follow. It would actually be almost dishonest not to have it mentioned if I suddenly pretended oh no what online following you know come on those two giving themselves the eye I mean you know I'd be the biggest fanfic writer I'd be writing my uh, what were the characters names um Hunter Hunter yeah I'd be writing my own Hunter fan fiction morning and night if those two are real yeah so 
it would there would be dishonest not to include that. That was all it was. And I'm not suddenly turning a page and going to be mentioning fanfic in all my books or anything. It was just those two really lent lent sort of that line of you know nar- <laughs> narrative to it. You know, it wouldn't have made sense in any. Oh, sorry. I was just say it wouldn't have made sense in any of your other books unless like Lauren turned out to be addicted to it or something like that. But I think the fanfic started getting cranked out right after the episode with the Green Fingers aired. Like, yeah, that for sure is the moment it started being written. There was somebody who was like, "That's it." Someone would have seen them stepping inside the space. The step inside the space is what started the Swan Queen thing um, in Once Upon a Time, and that was just that was the moment everything exploded. So I absolutely agree with you, Tara. The Green Fingers would have been mm-hmm. the beginning of the end. There, there was, like, one of them actually had a title. Green Fingers was in the title of the story. I just know it. It hasn't been written, but it, it was written. <laughs> <laughs> so, Lee, have people actually ever written fan fiction about your fiction? Um, no, but my beta reader threatened to... Um, when I did Shattered, which is my superhero novel that had a... Um, controversial ending my beta reader charlotte threatened to write a um a fanfic and, and fix the ending for me so <laughs> no that ending was perfect thank you uh, not everyone agreed but no she was like god damn it <laughs> so yes i only had one threat and no actual follow-through so you know all right well there we go listeners you got to help help an author out and write some fan fiction i think you should write some hunter fan fiction people i, I think that there should be a nice little story within a story within a story because, you know, two stories within stories is not enough. Wow, that's <laughs> so confusing, but okay. <laughs> you know what I'm saying. <laughs> so let's talk about your humor. Um, you have some of the funniest lines in this book. One of them is like Chloe says to Summer, why do you look like a constipated possum? Chloe's a New Zealander and possums yeah. are rife in New Zealand. Yeah, and Australia, yeah. Are possums a problem in Australia as well? Yeah, they get stuck in the roof space and then they um, they wee and, oh, my God, the smell. So, yeah, not a fan. Were they also imported for hunting purposes? I wouldn't know. Possums. I haven't done my research into mm, possum <laughs> Well, <laughs> as far as I know, they were imported into New Zealand for hunting, but the problem is that there are no natural predators in New Zealand, and so possums have just thrived. So the line, why do you look like a constipated possum from a New Zealander, was just beautiful. Excellent. Another very funny example of your humor is Summer is thinking about Elizabeth, and then she says, and then there was that voice. Could a voice get you pregnant? Summer was due any day if that was true. So let's talk about humor and your your work, you can't help but adding in these delightful little quips. Yeah, it's kind of me. You know, I'm I'm forever being told off by my girlfriend for not taking things seriously enough, so I try to be more serious in my real life, but in my writing, nah, screw it. (laughs) (laughs) People would just be dumb, say stupid things. Well, I love it. Tara, are there any other points you want to cover? I don't know. I just... I just love this book. I think, um, oh shit, now I'm going to fangirl and you're actually here. It's going to get embarrassing. I don't like doing this. So, That's why I secretly plotted it this I way. Oh, you're so mean. Diabolical Sheena. Anyway, so, I mean, it's not exactly a secret that I've been a fan of your books because I read The Red Files and I wouldn't shut up about it ever. I think I just talked nonstop about it for two years. Um, but. I guess the thing that I appreciate about your books is that like you get better from book to book. And um, this was kind of having this and under your skin come out in the same year. It's like, yeah, you, you hit another level. Um, and I really enjoyed reading it. And they were two of the most like unput downable books that I read this year. So I guess if anybody's listening and you kept listening, even though you haven't read the book and even though we spoiled everything, shame on you, but go read the book anyway, because you're still going to love it because we still didn't do it justice. Well, we didn't spoil everything. We didn't talk about the ending at all. I mean, it's a romance. They know the ending. They end up together. Oh, you see, now you've spoiled everything. <laughs> so, I've, got a, I've got a minor spoiler, actually, about the ending. I almost had a different ending, slightly, slightly, slightly different ending that I cut out in the end. But originally, I had in mind that Grace would slightly redeem herself 
by being the one to give a glowing verbal reference to Dame Margaret about that internship, about a certain character who got offered an internship. And then I took it out because that would just make Grace the ending. And I know she'd love that, but that's not really what the book was. It had to be Summer and Elizabeth. But it was just interesting that um, after all that shit, Grace finally did the right thing by them. But it's in my mind she did that, but readers don't know that. (laughs) No, that's out of character. Why would she do that for Summer? (sighs) Because it was true. Yes, it was one of the rare times she did it for no other reason. Uh, originally, I think there might be a slight thing that because also Elizabeth would appreciate it, but, yeah, she might have just done it because it was true. Like, she had no reason to lie, you know. Grace wasn't a liar. She wasn't a liar. She was a manipulator, but she... She was a liar. No, she... She absolutely she was. Like, she she was... said that she got... She said that she is the reason that... Elizabeth got Rachel as the agent. No, you're yeah. right. That she's, a a lie. she's a big she's a big bad liar. Who hated Summer. That that's the thing I don't understand. Like she hated Summer, so I don't see why she would have done it. Unless she's just and unless she's just a chaos demon who does things for no knowable reason. By the end of the book, don't forget, Grace is back to being herself. She's she's feeling safe and glorious again. She loved once more. So she doesn't need to be as brittle and you know it's amazing how generous you can be when you've got a lot of something it's actually hard to be generous when you don't so she's got a lot of you know adulation again and she's back in her zone so she can afford to throw a few breadcrumbs summer's way but like i said it got cut so you need not worry it's fine you can (laughs) cling push it to your heart i do like the idea of her being a chaos demon though i'm gonna go think about that more yeah I think you missed the brilliance that was her character because yes, she's nasty and all of that, but she does at one point when she sits down and she's talking to Elizabeth, she's so honest that I was just like, it's amazing. Think of it this way. Maybe I didn't miss the brilliance of Lee Winter because I ended up hating her character that much. What about that? Well, okay. (laughs) Some people really, really hate Grace so much, and some people are just like, oh, I didn't care for it. And again, we know the spectrum for this, for the narcissist scale as well. And she's quite high. She's not quite as high as Lola, but she's high. Yeah. Okay, but Lola was. Lola was a psychopath, wasn't she? Yes. Yeah. She was a psychopath. But she was also a narcissist, so, you know. I'm talking about Requiem for Immortals for anyone's going, well, who the hell is Lola? That wasn't Didn't in the book. gush about that in a different podcast, Sheena? There has to uh, be a podcast all about that. I'm just saying, like, go go to the go to the backlog. So I'm very excited because you're currently writing a spin-off of this book and we get to see Alex have a happy ever after, I assume. Yes, that's correct. It's, it's called well the working title, probably gonna be the actual title, is changing the script. And um she she gets given, Alex gets a bit of a tax problem. We won't go into why, but she ends up taking the worst script ever to do this movie in New Zealand, which ends up starring um, Chloe in She's Anne, Mistress of the Forest. It's as bad as it sounds, possibly worse than it sounds. And you get Skye who comes back. She's doing the costume. So you've got a really interesting dynamic with Skye is being a mother hen with Chloe, and she sort of takes on a bit of a mental role with Alex as well. And you also get to meet the local cop, Sam, who just really doesn't like this movie or the director or anything about it or how it makes the local women look bad because they've got these terrible costumes. That's before Sky fixes them. So it's just, <laughs> it's, it's really funny. I mean, it's actually not as funny as I think it is in my head, but I'm going to make it funny. <laughs> so who's the love interest? Is it, Summer and, I mean, not Summer. Sam the cop. It, it, Sam the, Sam the local cop. Samantha the local cop. Okay. Shame. So poor Chloe, who's heterosexual, and I feel bad for her about that, is <laughs> yeah, is still single. That's pretty sad. At least she has basketball. Yeah, actually, yeah, she she might have a dalliance with the local in this book as well. It's just a dalliance, but you know, she she doesn't go home unhappy. Let's put it that way. Okay, I can live with that. I mean, you know, she has yeah. to suffer through not falling in love with women, so. Yeah, she's 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 cool. With Tara's, that. Choice, eh? Tara's rolling her eyes at me. Absolutely, as you should, Tara. <laughs> oh, 
<laughs> oh, I guess people can't see me put my hands up and shrug because it's a podcast that we don't do video on. I just put my hands up and shrug oh. everybody. <laughs> Please, what were you saying? I, I, I do have a little bit of regret that I didn't make Chloe gay or bi or something because it would have been so obvious to hooker up Alex. But, you know, three times in my first book, I pointed out that Chloe was straight, so I can't change that now. Sure you can. But, Maybe um, she just finds anyway. the right person. Oh, do <laughs> I'm oh, just saying, we, we don't always know it's true, who we, don't. we are until yeah. later. Mm-hmm. And sometimes you just find... Maybe, maybe she's Demi. Who knows? Who knows? Well, anyway, she's 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 pretty straight in this book. But, yeah, no, so Alex and the local cop. The local cop who on the first day in New Zealand, Alex accidentally almost kind of runs over. So it was awkward. It was a bit unfortunate. It, it sort of went downhill from there. A little bit of accident. As, as it should. <laughs> Thank you so much both for joining me today. It was such a blast talking about Breaking Character. Thanks for having us. Yeah, same here, what she said. (laughs) Okay, so Lee, where can people find you online and where can they buy your amazing books and what should they read if they've read Breaking Character and loved it? They should read The Brutal Truth and online I'm on uh, Facebook and Twitter and Instagram as Lee Winter Oz, as an OZ. Um, I'm also on, I have my own website, leewinterauthor.com. And you can buy my books at Amazon and at Ilva the Publishing House as well. All right. And Tara, where can people find you online? They can find me on Twitter, uh, Tara M. D. Scott. And they can catch all my reviews at the Lesbian Review. And if you are on the Podbean site, you can click the little link on the side that says Les Do Books. Because that's my podcast where you can catch me talking to authors and reviewers about lesbic that they love. This has been the Lesbian Review Podcast. You can find this and other awesome shows by searching for the Lesbian Talk Show anywhere you get your podcasts. We're even on Spotify now. Find more information on our guest in the show notes, as well as links to what we spoke about on this episode. And if you've enjoyed this podcast and want to see us creating more awesome content, then consider becoming a patron. Not only does this mean we can keep on doing this, but you will get exclusive podcasts that do not appear on the channel. You can find out all about it on patreon.com slash the lesbian talk show. The link is in the show notes. That's all for this episode. Bye.